it's us again. This is my brother Peter, mom and dad, and I'm Dasha. Today we're going to be showing our friends Andrew and Lisa the basics of the internet, and we thought you might want to come along. It'll be cool. Now here's a little background. When we installed internet access on our computer, I got the whole family involved. It's true. Everybody had their own tasks to do. It was a lot of work, but it was really worth it. Mm -hmm. Now that I've gotten on the internet, I'd rather be on my computer than doing just about anything. It's really cool. The internet gave us a whole world of exciting new possibilities. So I guess this is a story of how it changed our lives. Maybe it will yours too. With the COVID-19 pandemic disrupting daily life, We've been adjusting to this new normal using digital platforms and video conferencing to make up for face-to-face -face interactions, telecommuting, increasing delivery services, and even deploying robots where we can. As this pandemic stretches on, it's becoming clear to us that some elements of this highly digitalized lifestyle are here to stay. As Rich told you, we installed the internet on our computer just a short time ago, and I haven't been able to get the kids off it ever since. Not only do they play the typical computer games that all the kids enjoy, but their curiosity for learning has skyrocketed. Peter is constantly quoting sports statistics and he can tell you the best surfing spots around the globe. <laughs> Not to mention the improvement in Peter's grades and Dasha's too. Having the internet in our home has had a great impact on our lives. Rich keeps up with the stock market and our investments and I'm able to pay the bills in half the time it used to take me. And the kids are improving in their grades and communication skills. Which makes me happy, as I would sure like them to go to college someday. Tech giants are also playing a very big role in facilitating the health and safety of the public during this pandemic, as well as enabling telework and communication, of course. But this really involves using location data from smartphones to do contract tra tracing, and uh, they're also needing a lot of health information as well. And this kind of surveillance would have been rather inconceivable a few months ago. There have also been privacy concerns with video conferencing platforms like Zoom. What could be done then to protect our privacy and security? Yeah, yeah, privacy feels sort of like a moving target sometimes. You know, I've been able to read some of my favorite cooking magazines online. I've even gotten some great gardening tips too. No wonder you guys are always so busy on the computer. Which makes me happy, as I sure would like them to go to college someday. That has to be my favorite line from that whole video. Kids introduction to the internet from 1990 whatever. Pretty hilarious if you look at it now. So yeah, has the internet impacted everyone's lives in more than just the ways that we imagined it would? Or that it was presented as when it first became a household thing? You tell me. <laughs> but it seems like a fitting segue into this video, this sermon that I came across, and I wanted to share with people and talk about a little bit because um, yeah, I came across this sermon from July 5th from Calvary Chapel in Spokane, Washington. And the title of the sermon is COVID-1984. So uh, naturally, I was rather curious as to what this pastor was going to say with a title like that. And honestly, I was quite surprised by how much I was saying amen and, and actually encouraged <laughs> by what I heard um, in a really unexpected way. Even though, oh, sure, there's <laughs> so many points and levels where how he approaches all these topics of you know the lockdowns and the coronavirus narratives and the rioting and the the racism debate and all that he covers a lot of ground in here but he weaves it all together bringing it back home to just the core of the gospel in a really great way and uh, but he uses orwell's book as, as sort of a lens which through to look at the things that he's talking about uh, and so i'm just going to play a couple clips here 
just to give you an idea, just as a teaser, but he's, he says quite a bit more that I don't have time to, to share, but there will be a link in the description below, but here's just to give you an idea. But as I've watched how silent and compliant we have been over the last 111 days, I, uh, and as we've been seeing ourselves declared non-essential and forcibly closed, handcuffed with many kind of unscientific restrictions. Not, you know, many times people saying, well, this is for health and safety, but they can't really prove the point. In fact, even this week, got a text from, from friends down in California. The governor there has forbid churches from singing in church anymore, lest they spread the virus. While at the same time, and we all know this, protesters, rioters, looters, and thugs were encouraged by those same governors and mayors to violate the restrictions that, because it was their right their, to freedom to express their First Amendment rights. And part of the question you have to understand is how do, how do we get here? And I think there's two sides of the equation. On one hand, we as a church let a lot of things happen because we don't want to get entangled in a lot of messy stuff. But at the same time, we have to understand the enemy of our souls never rests and always stays engaged and always in his tangled. And he always wants to set out and destroy something that's good and true and wholesome. 111 days ago, something happened that never happened, uh, that had never happened or never been tried before in the history of the world. The idea of shutting down entire nations and economies, um, a total lockdown. I mean, it's happened in the Soviet Union, it happened in Nazi Germany, <laughs> it happened even now, it has been happening for a long time in communist China. We've understood that these Marxist socialist countries have used this for a long time, and that's why I jokingly say to people, if you like, Mar if you like Marxism or you like socialism, you'll love the shutdown because that's essentially what life is under those systems. You're told what you can do and where you can go and how much gas you can put in your car and how far you can travel and when you can travel. And I mean, every, and I'm not saying this from complete lack of knowledge. I've been in those countries before and after. But the complete lockdown where there's, you can't travel, there's no commerce, there's, uh, and, and many draconian limits on personal freedoms. I can't help but feel that there was a time when Christians would have stood up and said, wait a minute, that's too far. We've been told that it was necessary to save 2.2 million lives in America alone based on a computer model that now we know was wildly wrong. And the same model had been used previously, three times at least previously, and had been wrong by a measure of magnitude each time. But what about that death rate? Today we hear about infection rates, not the death rate, which despite the rapid increase in infections, the death rate has continued to drop. In fact, according to the Stanford University antibody test, they said, quote, the actual death rate is between 0.1 and 0.2%. In other words, it's right on line, along with the seasonal flu. Now, if you don't think that's accurate, I actually have gone online. I've followed all the regional and local stuff and got the data. And if you look at um, the number of deaths, even the number of illnesses, it's, it's uh, very low. It comes out every time. I, I found it about 0.2%. Now, this is why I refer to the current crisis as COVID-1984. It's my little homage to George Elwell's 1949 novel by the same name. And um, Orwell, in, in the book, if you haven't read it, you should. It's a great read. It's a good book to read just for the fun of it. But nonetheless, he creates this fictional one-world socialist superstate that gains maximum control over its citizens through mass surveillance, through control of the media, and through suppression of dissent. And in a sense, what I want to do is leave the, the current dynamics of the, of the uh, pandemic um, and 
don't want to present myself as having expertise on the scientific part of it. I just, like a lot of you, have seen a lot of things that just don't add up. But that's not really my point. My point is how a society can be so shifted and altered. And it's interesting because there's this interesting terminology. We're talking about it's going to be a new normal. Well, that's an oxymoron if you think about it. If it's new, it's not normal. <laughs> if it's normal, it's not new. No, we're, we're, being, we're being directed into a whole different thing that has huge implications, I believe, for you and me. And I know there are some of you saying, I wish you wouldn't talk about this stuff. I wish I wasn't talking about it either. But I also feel that I have a, an obligation before God to speak to the truth of the church's situation, saying, if we don't begin to prepare ourselves for what's coming, we're spiritually going to be ill-equipped to respond in a godly way. So, yeah, he says, we're being directed into a whole new thing that has massive implications for all of us. And even just hearing that right there, I was just struck by the thought of, if I could at least get that far with a whole number of people um, in my life right now who are just having the hardest time <laughs> hearing anything I might have to say about everything that's progressed in 2020. You know, and all the usual objections to not wanting to hear hear about crazy conspiracy theories and don't go there, basically, <laughs> in, a, in a nutshell. But here you go. Okay, here's somebody who's... This is not a quote-unquote crazy conspiracy theorist preaching here. And I suppose it should go without saying that I'm not endorsing everything uh, this pastor teaches or even everything he says in this particular sermon. And I, you know, I'm not familiar with what all of his doctrines are on all kinds of things. So please don't take it as a blanket endorsement. And I'm rather confident that on the flip side, he's, you know, would have probably some bigger uh, difficulties with a lot of the things that I talk about uh, on the, on this channel and in my eschatology and cosmology and all sorts of things, right? But, you know, in fact, he <laughs> may not welcome any kind of endorsement from someone like me at all. But I kind of felt led to do so anyways, um, because the whole point that I'm kind of wanting to make by sharing this and with some family members, actually, was precisely that. It's like, okay, so even when you take all the, the New World Order... Illuminati, whatever stuff that, that triggers you and makes you just shut down and not want to hear any more about it or, or question anything. Here's just, just a quote-unquote regular guy. He's Yes, he's a pastor, but he's, you know, your typical kind of mainstream, you know, it's Calvary Chapel. For better or for worse, <laughs> you know, but whatever else, what objections you might want to make, he's not some nutball in a chat room somewhere. Obsessed with conspiracies. And he made several points that were kind of helpful to me to just kind of stop and reflect on. Uh, one part being where he says there that Satan, you know, <laughs> the church doesn't want to get entangled, doesn't want to get involved, doesn't want to get into the, the ruckus. But Satan never stops. He's always engaged. He's always entangled. He's always seeking to destroy all that is wholesome and good and true and of God. That he hates the church. He hates the gospel. He hates it when people are set free. He is the enemy. There is an enemy. And really, I mean, if you really boil it all down, all the stuff that we get into about the nuts and bolts of the, the satanic hierarchy, whether it's on the human side or people getting focused on the fallen angels and what, how that hierarchy works, it, it's all kind of moot at the end of the day, because it's really about whether you understand that Satan is the one who is behind the scenes doing everything he can to turn men away from God, turn men away from the truth, turn men away from Jesus and from repentance and salvation. And so everything that happens on an earthly sense is all geared towards that. The, the whole one world thing, it's not, he doesn't care about the people who are already rejecting God, right? It's coming after the truth. The truth of the cross. So if that's too conspiratorial for you, then we do got a problem, you know? And that's kind of the point that I, as listening to it, it's like you, you can kind of hit whatever walls here or there and you know, you're not ready for this, you're not ready for that, but it's like, can we go here? Can we at least agree on the main points that he kind of goes through? Because if we can't, then... 
either I'm a heretic or one of us, something's, you know, wh where is the common ground? Because the common ground is supposed to be Christ and him crucified. And I, th I believe he did say one thing that seemed to suggest that he's pre-trib rapture kind of doctrine there, but he made the point that there's nothing in the scripture that says that you won't experience persecution or difficulty in this life, even before the <laughs> your pre-trib rapture moment that would take all the Christians out so that, you know, they're not there for the mark of the beast or the Antichrist. So it's like even there, I have a different eschatological perspective on that point, but nevertheless, we can still agree in that, that these things have been happening in the past. They're not new. This is not some crazy theory. Totalitarianism is not a theory. Communism is not a theory. Do men with warped beliefs and godless ideologies come together and cooperate and conspire to bring about all kinds of... <laughs> At one point, do you just have to stop hiding behind the conspiracy theory deflection mechanism? Because that's really what it is. Either you believe in evil or you don't. At the very bottom line, you could summarize it all as just man conspiring against God in the end. But maybe that's that's what I think is, is weird, is, is that maybe that's the concept that really isn't there. That I don't know that a lot, a lot of Christians who have such difficulty with these kinds of topics and these kinds of questions, um, do they really believe that man is in rebellion against God? That the reason Satan is able to, to orchestrate and to infiltrate and to deceive humanity on massive levels with things like, you know, Darwinism or the Big Bang or infanticide, otherwise known as family planning, or all sorts of things. It's because of people's own rejection of God. Because their deeds are evil. I mean, even if the mark of the beast is a hundred years away, does it ultimately make any difference to the basic question of, are you really so afraid of dying from a disease and not having enough healthcare infrastructure in place to save the maximum number of people according to the models and according to the experts. Even if there really were people dying in hand over fist, even if there really was like a, a, a plague straight out of the X-Files where your eyes turned black and anyone who came into contact it was just done. I mean, that's the, that, that would, it would kind of make sense, right, to shut down the whole world economy if it was like something out of a horror sci-fi movie. You know, not, uh, it makes sense that the world could be so easily manipulated through fear of, of death because they are still afraid of death. Because they have no hope in the resurrection. So if your hope is in the resurrection and you know that uh, it's appointed unto once a man to die and then face the judgment, if you know that every time you walk outside, there's a million different ways your life could end in a moment. And God is ultimately in control of it all. And you don't just hide in your house and, and pray for the day when technology can deliver everything to your front door. God, I mean, good grief. Or maybe I think some of them are just still trying to convince themselves that it's, it's just temporary. It's just temporary. You're making a big deal out of nothing because it's all going to go in. You know, they're just in de denial uh, at that. Even though it's just being said point blank <laughs> in the media, in everything, that there, there's no going back to normal. There's the new normal. There's no in-depth, you know, connect the dots with the giant conspiracy uh, collage on the wall necessary to, <laughs> to figure out that, that, yeah, that the numbers don't add up. That the reaction doesn't add up. That destroying millions upon millions of livelihoods of families does not add up to try and save. It's all about the respirators. What happened to the respirators? We don't even hear. Nobody's talking about the respirators anymore. It's all about new cases, right? You just change, literally just change the emphasis whenever you want. <laughs> Groupthink is real. Newspeak. So yeah, definitely check it out if you get a chance. Um, and please, if you're going to comment or anything, don't... <laughs> I mean, this is probably a pointless request. If you're going to be a troll, you're, you're, you're going to be a troll. But try not to sound like a troll, you know? Don't attack him for whatever. 
you know, exercising discernment, biblical discernment means if you hear somebody speak and they're saying something that you can say, yeah, that's in line with scripture, then you acknowledge it. And that is the common ground. And, and I think those kinds of distinctions and lines are going to get more apparent as, as things go on. People who, who get it, even if they're not, you know, quote unquote, woke to New World Order or whatever, <laughs> do they believe that God is who he sa says he is? That Jesus is coming back? That Satan is the enemy of their souls? I mean, and do you really believe it or is it just hyperbole? You know, is it just rhetoric that it's spiritual things that we say in church, but we don't really believe really manifests in the world on, on a scale of any, you know, anything too, <laughs> too frightening? Well, those are the lines that people draw. We draw for ourselves, and understandably, because it is frightening and disturbing. But <laughs> that's why the gospel is such a big deal. That's why Jesus' victory at the cross and, and the empty tomb is the ultimate big deal. He had the power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. He has all the power. And the kind of satanic power that people think you can't attribute to Satan... It's like that doesn't touch God's power. <laughs> Satan, there will come a time. I mean, yeah, we're, they'll, they'll think the Antichrist rose from the dead, I, I suppose. We have not seen that happen yet. We've not seen anyone that the world looks at and goes, he's, he's risen from the dead. We're not looking at an image of the beast thing yet. We're not at the mark yet. We're building, it's all groundwork for it. So who knows what's going to happen. Oh, I also wanted to recommend Chris White's uh, recent podcast where he's just talking about a lot of this stuff. And I was really encouraged by it too, especially as I was really wrestling with you know, the whole question. Uh, you know, th Just this whole aspect of, of dealing with friends and family and, and talking to people outside the church versus inside the church or what that even means. And So it was a really good, it was a really good one. And I'll put the link in the description as well. I also had a couple um, kind of random announcement things. If anyone is in North England, I don't remember what like township or what specific city. We have a brother in England, in the northern part of England, who is looking to get baptized and trying to find somebody who will baptize him. And obviously right now that's more of a challenge than ever, even when it is when you're just trying to find a you know, fellowship in a, in a conventional church. But yeah, if, if anyone wants to email me, I don't know how far people would be willing to drive for something like that, but I would think that if it's at all possible to do it within a day and meet up with people, even if you're not close enough to, you know, be down the street from each other, just email me and we'll try and connect you with, with some uh, brothers and sisters in the UK there. And uh, how cool would that be to get baptized, you know, in the midst of all this going on? So yeah, just throwing that out there. And oh, the, the last video uh, did get taken down because I used somebody's drone footage and they got mad. So, you know, that's how that goes. And I will have to be more careful about that in uh, the future and more mindful. And the thing was, it really wouldn't have been a, a big deal at all to just or repost it with that it was just right at the end and just take that clip off or whatever but i think it sort of just felt like i like the the things that i had said about the whole gaza situation in in israel you know i probably wouldn't say you know even a week later uh, or not the same way um and that situation is something that's going to be ongoing and, and progressing more so there'll be more to say about it and everything but then as as far as like the bigger <laughs> the much bigger topic of zionism and the identity of Israel and how this relates to eschatology and things. Um, that's the topic that I honestly probably deserves a much bigger, more thought out, you know, treatment than just kind of being thrown in in the midst of current events type videos or whatever. But so I've been thinking about making a, a more of a full length piece, just really deep diving into that topic and you know, again, trying to do it in a way that just brings it back to the gospel and, and kind of emphasizes a lot of the things I think I did touch on in that last one that, that's down. But yeah, it's kind of been on my heart for probably over a year now. And I, in some ways, I think I'm dragging my feet because I don't. Not because I'm really worried about offending people, because <laughs> I think that ship has sailed a long time ago. But I think because it, it is a bit intimidating in terms of all the... um shall we say, sensitivities? I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of a hot potato. 
but it's it's not just that it's controversial, but that it really is something that I think has a lot of kind of interlocking pieces. There's a lot of sort of interrelated false doctrines that kind of work together. And so it's it's not the easiest thing to just take apart because it's the, this whole doctrine of that, you know, the land, the physical land of Israel still belongs to a certain bloodline from Abraham and that God is is all about reestablishing that as part of the redemption process for humanity or for the Jews. I mean, that's that's really kind of what I think is is uh, kind of the, the meta narrative that you're trying to take a closer look at and an honest look at through scripture. So it, it's going to be a lot of scripture, but I hope to be making some progress on that over the coming uh, weeks or months. And uh, we'll see how that goes. I will keep you guys posted on how that comes along. And uh, I, I do feel there's a need for it. It's just something, you know, you, you don't want to just dive into something like that lightly, you know. <laughs> But I'd appreciate your prayers and, and uh, just, yeah, any feedback or input you might have with that kind of topic. It has been something I've been talking about over the years, but not really as a central focus at any point. So it's always kind of just been in the background. But yeah, overall, I just want to let you guys know how much I appreciate all of you more than probably ever before. I think in the midst of everything we've seen happen this year and how I know for virtually everyone listening, you've <laughs> almost certainly been dealing with similar frustrating interactions with family and with friends and, and your churches and spouses and everything. Uh, it's, it, it's kind of pushing everyone to a point where, yeah, you got to take a stand some way, somehow, somewhere, some direction. And uh, the world offers this whole fractured, confused uh, soup of movements and slogans and propaganda to regurgitate. And we, you know, we really do see people being swept this way and that way by every wind of teaching because they're not grounded in the Word of God. And there's really nothing that we could do to better prepare for whatever lies ahead than to be grounded in the truth of His Word ourselves. So thanks for watching. I love you guys. Talk to you later. God bless. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain.
Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, and am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting.